Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley and welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. Today I'm going to continue our discussion of beer in the ancient world and what that teaches us about adaptation and business and values. If you go to Professor Google, what you're going to find is that the first brewery in Asia incorporated in 1855 in China, and that's Bupkis. What it should say is that the first brewery to be legally incorporated in the Western style of law was incorporated in 1855. The history of alcohol and beer in in Asia goes back so much further. In fact, they believe it may predate the history of alcohol in Iran by as much as 2,000 years. They found pottery shards in China that date back to 7,000 BC, and that's nearly 2,000 years before what they've been able to find in Iran. In particular, what they found, let me pull this up really quick so I make sure I'm getting it right. Here we go. Is that they tested these these ancient fragments of broken pottery, and what they found were evidence of, of rice wine, rice beer, something that had been brewed. And they found these these compounds that they knew were existing in the Shang Dynasty wines. And the Shang Dynasty was about 1600 BC. So 5,000, 6,000 years before then, they believed that there was beer and wine being brewed. The interesting thing is that we only know that because we have pottery. The history may actually predate that in both Iran and China because before pottery, people used leather skins or cloth bags that had been treated with oil or fat so that they wouldn't leak. And those items don't survive for thousands of years. So for all we know, the history of alcohol goes even further back. And what they have found are a lot of these older bronze vessels that they think were used for heating up alcohol. Now, the history of alcohol in China gets a little more complex. The earliest records we have of Chinese writing come from the Shang Dynasty, which were about 2000 BC to about 1000 BC, somewhere in that range. The earliest dynasties in China were comparable, at least when when you, you research their style, their power. Think similar to the Egyptian pharaohs. These people had absolute power. They had great wealth. They built tombs where they had weapons and food and statues and clothing and things to accompany them in the afterlife, this combination of shamanism and naturalism. And and, uh, they had this belief in the mandate of heaven as well. As Chinese society evolved, you have to understand that that heaven isn't what we understand in the Western sense. It's not, you know, God sitting in his heaven with clouds and angels looking down and controlling things. The mandate of heaven referred to the natural order of things, the will of the universe that was based on the virtues of those who, who did acts in this world. And the mandate of heaven keeps things in balance. It when someone is is doing something that is out of balance, when the people are being harmed, the mandate of heaven is removed from the leaders and they will be struck down and a more virtuous leader will take over their place. Particular uh, examples of alcohol and debauchery in ancient China in two examples. We know the final ru- ruler of the Zhe dynasty, the emperor Ji, was said to have shown his decadence by constructing a lake of wine and beer. Uh, He did it to please one of his concubines, and they said it was large enough that you could actually ride a boat around in this pool. Well, a few thousand years later, uh, the last emperor of the Shang dynasty, uh, Zhao Wang, he was originally, at least according to the myths, he was a very intelligent man. He surpassed everyone else in his wit, in his strategy, in his warfare, in his governance. But later in his reign, he started drinking, and he hit the bottle hard. And he had fantastic epic orgies. He had multiple concubines. And he started spending money left and right while ignoring the business of running the country. And then he started to abuse the people in the the counties around him and the areas around their capital by forcing them to support his decadent lifestyle. And he decided he wanted to recreate that giant pool of alcohol, but he was going to one-up them. So to please his, his first wife and concubine, he built this giant pool that was so large you could take multiple canoe-like boats around in it. And they filled the entire thing with beer and wine. But to top the previous pool, he built these islands throughout it. And there would be these these large artificial trees with branches sticking out over the water. And from those branches, the servants had to hang roasted meat. So these slaves would have to jump into the pool full of alcohol, swim across it to these little islands, and then hang this roasted meat so that the emperor and his concubines and friends and courtiers could 
take their boats out, and when they were thirsty, they could scoop up that wine to drink. And when they were hungry, they could reach up and pluck down that meat and eat it. Now, this pissed off the locals for many reasons. For the horrible waste of money, for the fact that they had to climb into this disgusting pool of wine, the fact that he was spending their resources and time there instead of dealing with the pretty rampant crime problems in the capital of Yen. But also, I think they were irritated that he was just wasting good wine. So they protested. They got angry. The people were suffering, and so it is believed that the mandate of heaven was removed from him, and the virtuous prince, the righteous prince uh, Ji Fa of the Zhao tribe, launched an attack, and he completely overpowered the Shangs. And Zhao Wang tried to flee, but he was hunted down and he was killed like a dog. And that was the, the beginning of the new Zhao dynasty. Zhao Wang is hard to understand, this last emperor of the Shang dynasty, because he his whole story is wrapped up. I mean, there's history, there's legend, and then you have the Chinese philosophers who came after him, who saw him as the antipathy of everything that they wanted in a leader. So they kind of reinterpreted his story to support their philosophical ideas about what a leader should be. And we're not really sure where fact ends and myth begins. For example, one of the stories about uh, what happened to Xiao Wang after he died is that he went to the gods and goddesses and he begged them for mercy. And the gods and goddesses said, well, we, we will consider making you, you a god as well and welcoming you into our ranks, but we have to consider your merits. Let's look at what you've done in your life. And after a detailed review, weighing the good and the bad, they did decide to make him a god. And they gave him the glorious title, the only thing appropriate to his history, which was the god of sodomy. That's Chinese karma for you. After Zhao Wang died, you had this capital of Yin, where all the people had been suffering for a long time. Thieves, robbers, rape, corruption, all of these things had been overwhelming the capital. And they believed that the, the officials had been vying with each other to violate the law. Who could top each other in atrocity? When the, this, this prince, uh, Ji Fa, threw out Zhao Wang, his father, King Wen, took over China at that time. They've been doing a lot of, of archaeological research to this about 3,000 years ago when King Wen took over China. Now, they found 44 pieces of bronzeware and two pieces of, prop, uh, of pottery in Baoji, Shanxi, I hope I'm saying that right, province. It's northwest China. They found this tomb, and they opened it up, and they found all this very interesting stuff. A lot of them are obviously tied to cooking, food storage, holding water, or alcoholic beverages, and the huge number of them indicate that this was a nobleman's tomb. The inscriptions on the bronze vessels may, may help them and figure out who it was, but the most interesting thing here is that when they, one of the containers they found was sealed. So when they shook it, they could hear there was this liquid inside and it was sloshing around and they started to speculate that it was the oldest wine ever found in China. The interesting thing, and I'm, I'm going to quote from the article here, is that that was a hasty reaction, but the presence of what is probably some sort of alcoholic beverage in a vessel was a particular historical note given its burial with another bronze piece, a square piece three feet long called a jin, which was inscribed with admonitions against the excess Excessive consumption of alcohol. And this comes up a lot in this early Western Zhao dynasty. They would have these, these cauldrons or, or drinking vessels, and they would inscribe on them admonitions against drinking. Part of that is because King Wen came in as the leader, trying to clean up the mess that Zhao Wang had created. And he decided to blame the Shang King's alcoholism for the entire fall of the dynasty. In fact, there, he gave this, this very famous speech, at least they believe he gave it, called The Announcement About Drunkenness, which has been written down in Chinese histories, copied over and over again. We don't know if it was entirely his or if it was invented at a later date. But here's, here's what King Wen supposedly said. I have heard it said likewise that the last successor of those kings was addicted to drink, so that no charges came from him brightly before the people, and he was, as if, reverently and unchangingly bent on doing and cherishing what provoked resentment. Greatly abandoned to extraordinary lewdness and dissipation, for pleasure's sake he sacrificed all his majesty. The people were all sorely grieved and wounded in heart, but he gave himself wildly up to drink, not thinking of restraining himself, but continuing his excess, till his mind was frenzied and he had no fear of death. His crimes accumulated in the capital of Shang, and though the extinction of the dynasty was imminent, this gave him no concern, and he wrought not that any sacrifices of fragrant virtue might ascend to heaven. 
The rank odor of the people's resentments and the drunkenness of his herd of creatures went loudly up on high, so that heaven sent down the ruin of Yin and showed no love for it because of such excesses. There is not any cruel oppression of heaven. People themselves accelerate their guilt and its punishment. So what he told the, the people after this was that he didn't want them to fall victim to the same foils that took down the previous king. So he told the young nobles if they had an unofficial office, if they had an official job, they could not drink. The only exception would be if they were offering up sacrifices. And if that was the case, they could have something to drink because he believed that the virtue that was present at the sacrifice would preside so that they wouldn't get drunk. But that didn't work out so well. So we had to intensify and create sterner measures. And this is another quote. If you are informed that there are companies that drink together, do not fail to apprehend them all and send them here to Zhao where I may put them to death. As to the ministers and officers of Yin, which was the Shang capital, who were led to it and became addicted to drink, it is not necessary to put them to death at once. Let them be taught for a time. If they follow these lessons of mine, I will give them bright distinction. If they disregard my lessons, then I, the one man, will show them no pity. As they cannot change their way, they shall be classified with those who are to be put to death. This is important because this new period, this new dynasty that was rising up, is the, is the culture that produced Confucius and many of the other great Chinese philosophers. And this rhetoric about the evils of drink and how it had brought down an entire dynasty, whether that's, that's accurate or not, that became a driving force in their definition of control and virtue and what made a good leader, all because of the drunken excess of one king. What we find in going even further back, this is not the only myth tied to alcohol in Chinese history. There are all sorts of stories about the origins of alcohol, that a brewer presented the first beverage as a gift to the emperor. I find that story particularly interesting because those who credit the invention of alcohol in Chinese history to this brewer, Yi Di, who gave it to the emperor Yu the Great about 2000 BC, it's another case where where alcohol, we know it was so important to the early culture because it was viewed as something that was given as a gift to the emperor who carried the mandate of heaven. Just like in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, in early European cultures, in South America, we know that alcohol, that the food that it was tied to, the sustenance that it was, was tied to leaders who were tied to heaven, to deities, to, to goddesses. And it was viewed as a blessing in many cases until the catastrophe of the Shang Dynasty. And that's an important thing to recognize, is that there are thousands of years of history where alcohol has been defined very differently for each of those different periods of time. And it's important to not get stuck in how we view it now, how we use it now as a, a social drink, as a luxury sometimes, as a an adult beverage, that there was a time when it was considered the greatest evil. And we've been through time periods like that in our recent history. There was a time period when it was considered a gift from the gods. There's a time period when it was considered absolutely necessary for life. And a lot of that also depends on what was being used at the time. So we're going to continue in a couple more of our podcasts discussing other areas of Asia. We're going to cover Japan and India to seeing you next time. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the subject that we discussed today, you can find multimedia content, links to articles we discussed, and videos on our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business and on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening.